Uh, greetings, everyone. We are uh, in our study on the book of, of the book of James, uh, calling this study "Living Faith." And today we are going to uh, be in lesson number eight, uh, "Wisdom from Above for Our Relationships Down Here" or our relationships on Earth. And the scripture that we're going to be looking at uh, from the book of James comes from the third chapter. Uh, we're going to pick it up where we left off last time with verse 13, and we're going to read to the uh, end of the chapter, which is verse uh, 18. Uh, we appreciate those who are joining us online, and we welcome you to this study. Uh, thank you for uh, participating with us. If everyone has their Bible uh, before them, I'm going to begin my reading. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life by deeds that are done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do you not boast about it or deny the truth? Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Let us bow for a few moments to our, before our Lord, and we'll go to him in prayer before we start our study. Our Father, as we uh, open this study this morning, we uh, do so before you, first of all, acknowledging your presence, acknowledging that you are the one who really is author of your word. We thank you for inspiring your servant to write these words down, and we pray that even as you put them in his heart, you bring them to our heart as well. And also help us within our minds to consider and to understand that which we are studying today. But prepare our hearts for this study as well, because even in understanding, it's not complete until we have accepted your word. And your word has become also the, the, the signal to us for obedience to you, that we might live our lives in a way that is honorable toward you, that honors you and gives you the glory that is rightfully yours. Help us to look at this as closely as we can. Reinforce things you've already taught us in this portion of your word in times past and introduce us to uh, something new from you today, something that we need to learn and to add to our understanding as well. I pray that you'll help me uh, to speak your, your word uh, in terms of teaching it, uh, that you will also, through your Holy Spirit, give a greater understanding not often, not always spoken in words that are spoken aloud, but spoken quietly and whispered into the ears of those who are studying it. To you, we give the glory and we give the praise as always through Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, as we enter to our, our study today, uh, I, I'm going to be sharing many things that are already obvious to you. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to uh, share them anyway, uh, reinforcing such uh, truths uh, where they need to be reinforced. Perhaps we'll introduce a few new thoughts along the way as well. One of the things I'd like to start with is with a, an obvious observation. Every day, you and I encounter different kinds of people. Uh, in fact, as we look around us in this room, while in many ways uh, we are familiar with one another, we note the differences that we find in the people that we are gathered with today. Those that are listening to us online, many of them we know very well. We're familiar with them. And yet well, they're not, they're all different too in their own way, each one of them having different characteristics about themselves. Uh, we're going to encounter, perhaps today, as we do most days, people that we are unfamiliar with as well. Uh, and that's just a part of life uh, as we go in and out of different places uh, in our times of journey throughout this day. So every day you and I are going to encounter different kinds of people, some familiar, some unfamiliar. And what we're going to find in those encounters is that some of the people that we encounter are quite delightful. 
And uh, but sometimes there will be people we encounter that are a bit difficult as well. We're going to encounter some people that are inspiring and others that are simply irritating. That's the way it is. And uh, some are going to be fascinating and others are going to be intimidating. And uh, we're going to encounter all kinds of people. And the fact is that many of the problems that you and I face every day in life and I'll have to do with these encounters, encountering people and all that uh, are sometimes people with different personalities than ours, uh, which creates conflict or can create conflict because we don't always get along with the people. Now, if it's a brief encounter, it's not a big deal, but sometimes we have to deal with people uh, more extensively and that's where it becomes the greater challenge. And, uh, but let me, uh, so, but this is, there's one thing you've got to understand. This is not something that's abnormal. It's, it's, it's part of the normality of the life in which we are living. And whether you are outgoing or whether you are shy, it doesn't matter. And uh, because really, when you think about it, we are wired for relationships. And uh, we, we need people in our lives. Now, some choose to have fewer people in their lives, while others want all the people they can get into their lives. They love relationships or the challenge of relationships, you might say. But God has made us for relationships. There's no one of us that is so uh, independent of others that he or she can live their life without the need for relationships with others. Relationships, therefore, are important. And I'll, so that's the first thing I want to st stress to you. You can, you know, I haven't put it in your notes, but I want you to understand relationships are important to the extent that when they are good, everything is wonderful. But when they are bad, everything is miserable. <laughs> now, life stinks. The life is all messed up. This is why it's important that you and I learn how to get along as best we can. Uh, we learn to get along with the people in our lives. We need to learn to develop and to maintain good relationships. And James is going to give us some practical advice today, how to relate to other people wisely. Now, this kind of wisdom that we're talking about is not, in fact, he mentions two kinds of wisdom here, doesn't he? And uh, one is earthly, or he goes so far as to say, in many respects, it's even of the devil. The other is from above, it's heavenly. And uh, we need that kind of wisdom because relating to people wisely is not something that comes naturally, nor can it be, uh, can it be had educationally. Uh, education will give you uh, some understanding. It will improve your intelligence to a point, but it won't make you necessarily a wiser person. The kind of wisdom we're talking about can only be received supernaturally. That is, it comes from above. It comes from God. And uh, one of the key words in light of all of this, uh, or key phrases that I want to draw, uh, draw out at this time and bring to your attention is verse 18. Notice what it says in verse 18. It says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. That is actually the key verse, I think, in, in this whole text that we're looking at this, this morning in verses 13 through 18. It's the very last verse there. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Now, James is uh, saying relationships are kind of like a, a, a farmer or a gardener, if you will, who is planting seeds. You need to know the seeds you have in hand before you put them in the ground, because whatever you plant eventually is what you're going to reap. So if you sow in anger, for the most part, you're going to reap, if you will, uh, anger or, or the response of anger to your life. If you sow in jealousy or if you sow uh, in, in injustice or, 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 or whatever you want to say that's negative, you're going to eventually reap those kinds of consequences. But if you're looking for love, if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for things that are uplifting, that are positive, then this kinds of seed you should sow or be sowing are those particular kinds of seeds. Because generally what you sow is what you're going to reap. 
And uh, so if you and I are wanting to build good relationships, we need to be sowing the kinds of seed that have the tendency to bring about good relationships. And uh, we need to be doing the things that, as Jesus would say, uh, you know, we need to be doing unto others as we would have them to do unto us. And, uh, and so we should be sowing seeds that are going to bring about a peaceful relationships. And by peaceful relationships, it just means relationships that are, are mutual, that are able to, to uh, you know, not only do good, but to receive good uh, in return as well. So we're going to learn how to plant seeds of peace. And now we're going to be talking about that, if you will, in just a few moments. Uh, now, this is important. And we need more people sowing in this manner. Because if you haven't noticed it already, I'm going to enlighten you. All right. Uh, as not often, I get that opportunity. But I'm going to do it. Here you are. I'm going to enlighten you. You and I live in a world where common sense is not common. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we live in a world where common sense is simply not common. Now, there are a lot of smart people in this world, people who have degrees. I mean, some of them have all these degrees lined up, uh, you know, all the ABCs and the alphabet after their name. But being smart doesn't make you wise. And uh, being a smart person uh, doesn't mean you're always doing the wise thing. And uh, so, in fact, there are many very smart people that unfortunately, they they just bomb out when it comes to relationships. And uh, they, they can relate to a book more than they can relate to a person. And, uh, they, they know all the facts, but they don't know how, they don't have a lot of things going on when it comes to feelings and, and the understanding of the people around them. So the first thing James is going to tell us, and I want you to look at verse 13 here. The first thing he's going to tell us in verse 13 is that wisdom is, to, is supposed to be a lifestyle for God's children. It's a lifestyle. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds that are done in humility that comes from wisdom. And our wisdom is something that is to be displayed by the life in which we live. It's a, it's a, a lifestyle, if you will. It, it has Wisdom has nothing to do with intelligence. And that's not a put down when it comes to intelligence. The, there's good things to be said for that, but it really has nothing to do so much with intelligence. It, what wisdom has to do with, and this is what I want you to get, wisdom has everything to do with your character and your choices. That's what wisdom is all about. Wisdom is about your character, and it's about the choices that you make, uh, what you choose to say, what you choose to do, or how you choose to act. And uh, that's what wisdom is all about. Let him show it. That is, let him show his wisdom how? By his good deeds, by deeds that are done in humility that comes from wisdom. And don't fail to understand the wisdom of which he's talking about is the wisdom that comes from God himself. And James wants us uh, to know that it's important and how, uh, how we get along with the people in our lives. And uh, you and I show how wise we are by, by the way in which we are able to deal uh, with people in our, our relationships, with people that are easy to get along with, with people that are also harder to get along with. And uh, it's not just some people, but it's all people uh, learning how to deal with, the, with the, all of the challenges and all of the, the differences that we're going to come up in, in, in terms of the, of the people that we have in our lives. Uh, it's so easy for us to 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 deal with the people that that mesh with our own personality that uh, that have a, a an easygoing personality or whatever of their own, uh, and then we have a tendency to want to push away, if you will, or or, uh, or to try to limit in whatever ways we can those other relationships that are more difficult and more challenging. You know, if you look at Jesus' selection of disciples, he had an interesting bunch of people when it comes to, uh, to their personalities. They weren't, all, they weren't always easy to get along with, were they? Some of them were very challenging, to say the least. I can only imagine Simon Peter and how 
difficult and how challenging he could possibly be on occasion. And, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Judas Iscariot was one of the easiest of those in the bunch to, to get along with. And, uh, but uh, Jesus, uh, he dealt with all of these. He didn't choose them because they were all like himself. Now, he was going to do things in our lives that were going to change their personalities eventually to, uh, to whatever degree, but he took them as they were. And that's how we have to take the people that we that are put in our lives as well. If you don't learn to be, if you don't get this wisdom and learn to apply it in your relationships, uh, your relationships can be very horrible. They can be a mess. Uh, it can be a disaster. Notice what James says here in verses 14 through 16. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth because such wisdom does not, uh, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you have disorder and every kind of evil practice. That's the kind of wisdom that, that, that we have on earth. That's, that's where it leads. It doesn't lead to a, a good conclusion. And, and if you and I are finding those conclusions and we are consistently uh, you know, uh, behind them, or, uh, we, we need to look at where we're, where we're getting our wisdom. We need to look at, at uh, you know, what makes us the kind of people where those kinds of things would, would come from. And uh, because that kind of wisdom leads to chaos, it leads to disorder, and it leads to confusion. Uh, and you see the evidence of this all the time in our world. You see it in the home, you see it in the workplace, you even see it in the church, unfortunately. It happens there when we do not have wisdom from above and all, whatever wisdom we have is not the kind of wisdom that generates a good a good conclusion. And that's what James wants us to understand. So in the remainder of our time together today, and for the remainder of what we're, uh, of the text that we're going to be looking at, James is going to give us a wisdom test. He's going to tell us some things about wisdom, and he, and then he wants us to look within ourselves and reflect upon that. Is this what we find within our lives and why we need to find it within our lives or why we don't? And all, we were go we're going to have to answer those kinds of questions. The wisdom that comes from above, that's what we're talking about. James says a person with this kind of wisdom, then a, a wise person, a truly wise person, first of all, if you're taking notes, has integrity. And that's the first thing I want you to jot down. The wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, pure. A person with this kind of wisdom has integrity. And when it uses that word pure, and I, I've underlined it there in my notes, I don't know if I gave it word, that to you in your notes, but you can write it down. That word pure doesn't mean perfect. And all the person, person who has wisdom is not a perfect person by any means, but a person who is undefiled, uh, a person who uh, uh, is authentic, a, a person who is uncorrupted. That's what we're talking about. It's a person, a, a person with wisdom, and uh, will more, more, more likely not lie or cheat or deceive others. And uh, they, they know that's not the way in which we relate to people in relationships with them. We demonstrate honesty and respect toward other people. So the first thing I want to emphasize in terms of what James is telling us is that a wise person has integrity. And all they, a person who, who lives their life undefiled, if you will, uncorrupted, uh, a person who is authentic, uh, a person who is not prone to, to lie and to cheat and to, and to deceive. Uh, that is a wise person. Uh, secondly, James tells us that a wise person does not stir up trouble either. So I want you to jot that down. He, he refers to him as being a peacemaker, if you will. Uh, a person who stirs up trouble is a person generally, uh, how would you see them? A person who carries a chip on his shoulder, let's say. Uh, a, a person who goes around looking for a fight. You think of anybody like that as somebody who, who who's who's looking for a fight, uh, a person who is not a peacemaker, obviously, 
but a wise person is a peacemaker. In other words, a wise person, for the most part, on their part, and you know, is trying to create and maintain harmony uh, among uh, among others, not at the point of sacrificing truth, not at the, not at, to the extent and all that they. Uh, are are always just not dealing with the with the things that are wrong or bad around them, but they are looking for uh, the higher road, if you will, the higher road. Whereas one who is unwise and uh, is complaining, uh, demanding, criticizing, they're they're walking the lower road. They're they're only making things worse, and all uh, by the way in which they react. And all they, when they don't see something that's not right or that they don't think is right, and all they are out to jump all over it. They stir up trouble. Uh, but the peacemaker is looking for the higher road. Realize, even when it realizes there's a problem, it deals with the problem in a more positive way rather than in a negative way. That person is looking somehow to somehow come out in a way in which the situation could be rendered better rather than worse as a result of whatever they say or whatever they do. It's the kind of person that is in their relationships is always looking for ways to build up rather than to tear down. And, uh, and, uh, and we know, we know in life that, uh, that it's not always going to work out essentially uh, the way in which we would like for it to, to do so. But a peacemaker more often will find the better solution rather than a worse solution, which is what uh, an unwise person would do in relationships. But there's a third thing James brings to our attention here when he's describing a wise person. He tells us that a, w a wise person is considerate of others. A wise person is considerate of others. Uh, and in the NIV, it simply uses the word considerate. But what does that mean? It means to be mindful of the other person's feelings. And, uh, and why is this essential or why is this so important? Because we live again in a world where more often, unfortunately, uh, it seems like more people are selfish rather than selfless. And as a result of being selfish and all, they're thinking more of themselves, obviously, than they are the other person and the other person's feelings. They don't mind hurting the other person's feelings. And all. It's their feelings they are more uh, interested in. An unwise person will minimize, therefore, the feelings of the people that are around them. And that leads to a tendency of using other people rather than letting them be, be the blessing they could be, we use them to milk from them whatever we need or get, regardless of whatever the consequences are for them, because we're still thinking simply about ourselves. We're thinking about what, you know, what really makes us happy, what really fulfills us. And we are not considerate of the other person for that reason. Now, this person, unwise, is not going to build good relationships and is going to even destroy what could be good relationships. You see this, unfortunately, in many marriages uh, where a, a, a lot of marriages are, are, are lost. Uh, certainly a lot of us are, are struggling because of this kind of selfishness that I'm talking about when one is not considerate of the other. Let me give you a Bible verse, and this is not the only time it's mentioned. This is mentioned in, in several other places, but the one that comes to mind is in the book of Philippians, and it's in chapter 2, and it's verse 3. If, if you want to jot that down, chapter 2 and verse 3 in Philippians, think of the other person. Think of the other person as being better than yourself. You've heard that before. Now, that's not a put down of yourself. What it means is to think of the other person more valuable, uh, more esteemed, if you will, uh, uh, than you would of yourself in the sense that you you don't overrate yourself you know, at their expense. You, but you, you're not robbing yourself. But when you think of that person in this manner, you're more open to them and more welcoming, if you will, uh, of that person and what they they can be. You'll be the one in a real sense while you, uh, while you are a blessing to them, you will be the more blessed from them and all by considering them in a more positive way and all, it enriches your life as well as it possibly would enrich theirs. Uh, so it's not a matter 
uh, when I'm considered of, considered of others, it's not a matter of saying, well, uh, I just, instead of taking advantage of them, I'm making myself now where, uh, where they will take advantage of me. That's not what it's talking about. It's giving them, if you will, giving them a higher place in your thinking uh, so that, that you are, have the p potential to be a greater blessing for them and for them to be a greater blessing for you as well. That leads me to the fourth thing that James leads to, and I think in proper order. Number four, James tells us that a wise person is submissive. A wise person is submissive. Now, what does that mean? Oh, Paul uses this word many times in his letters. One that comes to mind is, again, in the book of Ephesians, when he is writing toward the end of his letter in the Ephesians, he says this in chapter 5 and in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for or reverence to Christ. You know, it also goes on to say there, uh, something that uh, you, you've heard probably many times, more in the past, I dare say, than you do in the present, uh, when it talks about wives submitting you know, themselves to their husbands. Uh, I, I'll never forget when I started hearing different women when I was counseling with a couple about marriage and, and we were getting to the point of, of, the, of doing the ceremony and talking about the words we would use. They did not want that in there. They did not want to, you know, to repeat that particular phrase, even though it was out of the Bible, because they saw it in a totally negative way. You know, I'm not going to submit to him and let, you know, I'm not going to be his doormat. I'm not going to let him, you know, walk all over me, give up my rights, if you will, and, and give him, uh, you know, all the rights. Uh, they would want to argue that with me. They wanted it taken out of the ceremony because they, they didn't, because they didn't understand it. They didn't interpret it rightly. It also talks in that same phrase about men being submissive as well. Not just the woman, but the man. In fact, it begins here with verse 21, submit to one another. That's everybody. That's everybody. That doesn't leave anyone out of the picture. We are all to be submissive to one another. And uh, every one of us in all of our relationships. And when we're not and uh, whether it's on the part of the husband or on the part of the wife or on the part of any one of us in relation to the other, that's when things have, have a way of getting out of order. A wise person knows this. The reason I can be submissive in terms of the people that I have a relationship with is because I can learn from anybody. I can. I can learn something from anybody. Uh, you, know, you might say, well, I know somebody you can't learn. No, I can learn from the, the, the worst of people you can think about, as well as the best of people you can think about. You and I can learn from anybody. The whole point is this, being submissive means when we're submissive in our minds and our hearts, we're not as likely to be defensive. And there's, there's really the problem. When I become defensive, and uh, I'm, I'm again, putting up a wall, I'm going to have a hard time getting much of anything from my relationships because I'm always on the defense. I'm always concerned about what's being said to me, what's behind it, and what's being asked of me. And, and so uh, I, and I, and, and another tendency is not only being defensive, but being stubborn as well. Uh, you, it's harder to learn from life and learn from the people in your life uh, because you already think you know it all or you already or, or you're afraid to be open to other people's ideas. But the, the idea of being submissive is the idea of being open. That's all it is. It doesn't mean that I give up what I believe altogether, that I just throw it away, that I let that other person tell me whatever and, and, I, and I just submit to that. Listen to the people in your life. Uh, if you don't agree necessarily, or you find that they're wrong, you don't have to go along with it. You don't, you know, you're, you're not, you know, the Bible's not telling you, you know, just to be uh, steered whatever way uh, in the relationships you have in life. And there's people like that, sad, sadly to say. And, uh, but be open to the point that, you know, okay, you know, that person is right. And I'm not wrong, or that idea is better than my idea. You might learn something. You, your life will be improved for it. 
uh, and also a, a year, you, you can be a greater blessing as well. Because when you're open to people, that has a tendency in time to hopefully make them more open to you. And, uh, and when you're submissive to them, that, that has a tendency and turn for them to be submissive to you. I know there are always, always, you know, uh, people we can think of that don't, don't, it doesn't work. That's the world we live in. And uh, that we, but in many of the instances, it improves relationships. So James tells us a wise person is submissive. That speaks of humility, doesn't it? And uh, that speaks of, of a person who, who is willing and willing to risk being more open to the people in their life. And uh, number five, James tells us that a wise person is full of compassion. That's the next thing he says. A wise person is full of a compassion. He uses the words, or I see the words here in my NIV, full of mercy and good fruit. Full of mercy and good fruit. That is a person that's full of compassion is compassionate in both word and in deed. Uh, wisdom is, is like that. Wisdom uh, leads a person to being able to say what needs to be said and then doing what needs to be done in the most positive way of ways. Now, wisdom may not be looking for another person's faults. A wise person is not necessarily looking for the faults in the people of their lives, but they, they certainly can find them eventually. You don't have to look for them. We have a way of displaying them from time to time. All of us do. But when we, when a person, a wise person sees the faults in other people, he doesn't jump on those faults and on that person and all. He doesn't see himself or she doesn't see herself so much as their judge, as their, as, as, uh, because the Lord, while he certainly is our judge, many times he chooses to be our redeemer rather than our judge. He offers us mercy. And doesn't he? Rather than justice. And aren't you glad of that? And uh, because I, I can't think of a time, of many times I would want to stand before my Lord and demand justice. Very, those are very few moments of my life, but I can think of a lot of times when I was open to mercy <laughs> and would welcome it in, in my life. And uh, so the, the idea here is that uh, a wise person is not so apt uh, or so likely, if you will, to hold the faults of another over their head and, and, and to you know, take this, to, to rub it in or, or to beat them down with it. Wisdom doesn't take advantage of another person's weaknesses or uh, their failures so much. Notice it says full of mercy and good fruit. Full of mercy means not giving that person what they deserve. And there's so many times in relationships where I know I'm happy I wasn't given what I was what I deserved, not only from God, but from other people in my life. When somebody withheld judgment, even though I could be judged and offered me mercy and forgiveness. Wisdom is being something better, if you will, than 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 you have to be. It's encouraging, if you will. Uh, when encouragement is so needed. Notice it says good fruit as well. Wisdom is not just kind words, but it's also kind deeds. Full of the good fruit. It's kind actions. That's what the good fruit is. Kind actions. Wisdom, again, taking the higher ground. Not only says the right things, but does the right things. Not only says them as they need to be said in the right way, but does the things that need to be done in the right way as well. That's what wisdom leads a person to do. I need that kind of wisdom for my life, as I think all of us would say, we need it, you need it as well. We need people, more people who are full of compassion in our relationships. And we need to be one of those who's contributing such compassion in, the, our, in relationship with others. Finally, number six, James tells us here that a wise person is impartial and sincere. Impartial and sincere. There are two words used here in the Greek when, uh, that are being used in the Greek, but they, they come out as one word. We, call, we say impartial and sincere. The words that are saying, the two words that are being used in the Greek are, I say one word, they're really two words, without hypocrisy. That's what we're talking about, impartial and sincere or without hypocrisy. A wise person is genuine 
A wise person is straightforward. A wise person is someone, what you see is what you get. And uh, you, you, they're not one thing before you and something else when they're not in, before you. They're not two people. Now, the word that James is using here is very interesting. And I want to take just a moment to dwell on this. In James' day, the word hypocrisy that he was, u- that he was using here when he talks about sincere, if you will, uh, uh, and uh, and impartial uh, was a word that was used commonly in the theater uh, in James Day, uh, uh, and and the word hypocrite really was a, a word that was used by those who were acting. A lot of times when they would act in that day, and I and I don't know all the details of it, but they would carry around masks. You know, in their hand, they'd have a mask and put one mask in front of their face while they were portraying one character and then put another mask in front of their face when they were portraying another character. And often they were portraying more than one character at a time. So you you never know what you were going to get. Uh, they were two masks, two face. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you ever heard of two faced people? <laughs> people? Well, they 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 you never knew which one you were going to get. Are they going to be wearing this face or are they going to be wearing that face? You, you never you never knew which one you, you were going to get. That's what James is talking about here. Uh, you know, he said, when you act, that's OK, because that's what you're doing. You're acting. But that's not the way you should act if you will, in reality. And uh, you and I aren't to be two-faced or we're not to be, if you will, wearing uh, a different mask. And, and you've heard of people wearing a mask. Uh, uh, they come to church wearing a mask or they uh, go to other places and they wear the mask they want the people to see wherever they are, whatever crowd they're in. But now if they're somewhere else, they may be wearing a whole different mask because they're portraying themselves differently to those people. Regardless, uh, when we are being two-faced or we're not always being genuine, if what we're supposed to be, and uh, we are, we are, we are not living in a way that uh, is is that is true and that is honest before all the people. Uh, we're living our lives in a way that people really don't know. You know, when we show up, who they're going to get. You know, who's showing up at my door? Am I going to see Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? <laughs> you know, when I open the door, you know, what, what, what have I got here? You know, what kind of, we need to be always who we really are. And we need to be right in terms of always who we are. Uh, the, this kind of, when, you, when you're not hypocritical in this way, when you're impartial and, and sincere, then people know what they are getting. They, they begin to know that and, and they, they, uh, they are more accepting of you. Uh, they are more uh, because they know you are, are a sincere person. Otherwise, they are going to always be wondering, doubting, because you are always wavering. And society, unfortunately, is filled with this kind of people. It's filled with people who are phony, if you will. And it's not being ugly. It's just being, being honest. They're, they're, they're phony. And because they are phony, and they are they they are always changing some without even thinking. You know, it's just natural for them to be unnatural, and uh, and and they are phony in their in their relationships. Uh, you know, always you never you you know you you never know really who they are because they're always masked. You just don't know which mask they're going to be wearing uh, on that particular occasion. But you always wonder, regardless of the two masks, what is the reality? You know, that it, because the reality of that person is never really uh, being revealed, or at least of what that person could be. We cannot build and maintain good relationships unless we are impartial and sincere. So you see all these things, and, and you know, we look at ourselves, I, I, like I said, uh, we, uh, we are not perfect, and, and, and we all have room for, for improvement. But these are all the ways in which this kind of wisdom from above is portrayed in our relationships, uh, and it makes for better relationships. That's one thing we can all agree upon. All these things that James says are things that are needful in order to build, in order to 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 uh, uh, and maintain uh, good relationships in our lives. So where do I get this wisdom? 
Remember, there's two kinds of wisdom James is talking about briefly. He mentions the one of this world, the one that is uh, he calls that is uh, uh, unspiritual. Uh, it's of the devil. Uh, that kind of wisdom, whatever it is that the world offers, is not the kind of wisdom that leads to the results that we need in good relationships. Uh, and it may look good. It may even sound smart but it doesn't deliver when it comes to benefit of relationships that we have. Uh, we need the relation, we need the wisdom that comes from above. Now, if you go back a few weeks with me to, to chapter one in the book of James, you remember what it said in verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all. You know, that's what we need to do. Every day, I need to ask God for wisdom. Every day. I don't know in my day. I might, I may have some uh, meetings prepared and, and, and planned. Uh, and so I know who I'm going to be meeting with. Uh, and, I, and I can prepare myself in light of that. But there are encounters that I have as a minister, and I've known this throughout my ministry, uh, of a lot of the meetings that I didn't know were even coming. I didn't know it until they got there, until it happened. And I needed to be prepared for those too. I didn't have the luxury to do that ahead of time because I didn't know they were even coming. So I need to ask the very first thing in the morning, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom for today. Give me wisdom in light of whatever the encounters I'm going to have. Uh, because even if it's somebody good, if they're hurting, I need wisdom. How do I answer them in their time of hurt? You know, what do I say to them or what do I do uh, that's going to be helpful and encouraging for them? I need wisdom for those kinds of things. I need wisdom and all for for the decisions I'm going to be making, even though they may not all look all that big. And uh, they all have have consequences. They all all have uh, results. Uh, I want to make good decisions. I want to make good decisions. So I need wisdom, Lord. I need wisdom for this. And just because I asked God for wisdom yesterday, I don't, I need to ask him today. And, I, and tomorrow I'll need to go to him again. And, uh, and I think the Bible encourages us uh, uh, as far as requests to make this one of those things that we do daily. And maybe even several times during the day, asking God for wisdom. And uh, because we need what God knows. And we need also to uh, what God has to be able to react wisely. You know, uh, Solomon made a lot of mistakes. He, he, he made some very bad decisions in his life. <clears throat> but uh, he made one good one <laughs> at the very beginning when he asked for wisdom. Unfortunately, he didn't always use what he was given <laughs> at all. But he, he asked for the right thing. He asked for wisdom. He got more than wisdom, but he asked for wisdom. And that's what you and I need to do in our lives as well. Listen to this. I, I think I gave it to you in your notes. Uh, Proverbs 3, verses 13 through 15. I don't know if it's written down in your notes or not, but I'm going to give it to you. Uh, I'll share it with you. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom. The man who gains understanding for wisdom is more profitable than silver and it yields better returns than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. That's pretty good. Pretty good thought to end with and to remember. And hopefully uh, we will set our hearts for, for wisdom. We, I don't know how much smarter I can get, but I hope I can get a lot wiser. And uh, that for, that's for sure. If I get no smarter than I am today, please, Lord, I'd like to be wiser uh, day by day in terms of uh, the life that I'm being called to live in relationship with others. I want to thank those of you who are uh, studying with us online today. Uh, when we get we come back together next time, we're going to uh, enter into chapter four. Of, of the book of James. We're going to be looking at the first 10 verses and we're going to be talking about how to end all wars. You know, right now with what's going on in the Ukraine, I guess that might not be a bad thing to be studying. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had no more wars? Well, we're going to talk about how to end all wars. Uh, and all the wars I'm thinking about are not always on a national scale. Some of them are a little more up close and personal, <laughs> but they're wars nonetheless. And we need to, wouldn't it be great to end all wars?
Well, we'll talk about that in our next time. Let us uh, close with prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this time we've been able to spend with you and with others in your word for what we've learned today, uh, the significance of it. Again, knowing that uh, while we are, are being uh, pushed by our world to learn and learning is good, nothing wrong with that. And uh, we need to be becoming wise as well. But we're not going to get wisdom from a, a school from a higher a school of higher education, not from the books that we read other than this one book, your word. And especially though realizing even there, uh, it just points us to our source, which is you. And I'll make us wise, Lord. Make us wise in our understanding, wise in our, our decisions toward others, as well as toward you and even to ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.